What most people don't realize about peppermint oil is that it's both a vasodilator and a vasoconstrictor, depending on where you apply it. So it can improve blood supply in this area while constricting it in this area. So if you're applying it to your scalp and you don't know this, you need to understand that Hi, this is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and in today's video, we are going to dive into the science behind peppermint oil. Can this essential oil regrow hair? And if so, is it safe? What's the best concentration? How many times per week should we actually use it? And how does it stack up against other hair loss treatments? That's all coming up. Peppermint oil is a cross between water mint and spearmint. It grows throughout Europe and North America. Peppermint oil is extracted from the leaves and the flowers of the peppermint plant. And one of the key components of this oil is something called menthol, which is what gives that peppermint its cool, refreshing taste and smell. Some studies have linked peppermint oil and its components, such as menthol, to a number of health benefits. And these benefits are partly why some people believe that peppermint oil might help regrow hair. For instance, studies suggest that common hair loss disorders, like androgenic alopecia, are caused in part by inflammation. Peppermint oil has anti-inflammatory properties. Studies also show that balding scalps have 40% lower oxygen levels and 2.6 times less blood flow than non-balding scalps. Peppermint oil can act as a vasodilator to improve blood flow. And other studies link male and female pattern hair loss to microorganism overgrowths. Peppermint oil has antimicrobial properties. And if you're interested in understanding how much weight any one of these causes might have in your hair loss equation, check out our video about what causes hair loss. I'll link that below. But what really got people excited about peppermint oil was a 2014 study that made its rounds on hair loss forums and at the time was considered by many to be a breakthrough. In that study, researchers wanted to find out how peppermint oil might affect hair growth in mice. So they took 20 mice, shaved them, and then sorted them into four groups, with each group getting a different substance applied to their backs on a daily basis. Salt water, jojoba oil, 3% minoxidil, or 3% peppermint oil. Four weeks later, the researchers ended that experiment and evaluated a series of skin and hair parameters in the mice. Here were the key results. Of all four groups, faster hair growth was observed in the peppermint oil group even more so than minoxidil, and that's an FDA-approved hair loss medication. In fact, you can see that at week four, the peppermint oil group had gotten back almost all of their hair after shaving, while the mice and the other three groups, they still had noticeable missing patches of fur. The mice given peppermint oil also saw significant improvements to skin thickness and hair follicle counts and hair follicle depths. And the peppermint oil mice showed greater expression of enzymes and growth factors that positively impact hair growth, like alkaline phosphatase and insulin growth factor one, or IGF-1. So the peppermint oil mice not only saw better hair growth and more hair follicles, but the researchers also demonstrated how that new hair growth might be happening through at least two pathways. All of this sounds great, and so it's no wonder why this study made its rounds on hair loss forums and generated a lot of excitement. People started applying peppermint oil to their heads. Manufacturers even started adding it to their hair growth serums and topicals. I mean, a lot of people were thinking that this topical was going to be a game changer. And you can't blame them given the way that these results were getting summarized by forum users. So fast forward 10 months later, what happened? Well, those beta testers on peppermint oil, they sort of went quiet, forum excitement calmed down. Some people on YouTube reported hair growth from peppermint oil, albeit when used alongside a bunch of other treatments. But almost everyone who initially tried this treatment experiment, they reported no results, ambiguous results, or they just went AWOL, or were convinced it really didn't do much as a monotherapy. In other words, no human appeared to be able to really replicate the results seen in that study. So how can this be? How can something that looks so promising in a study turn out to be so unremarkable in real life? And are these anonymous online anecdotes, I mean, are they really that reliable? Shouldn't we prioritize published research like this study over the opinions of random people on the internet? Well, a closer look into the data on peppermint oil paints a more nuanced picture. The first issue is that that 2014 study it was on mice, not men. Mice, they're usually not the best models for human hair loss because mice, 
They don't actually suffer from the most common hair loss disorder for which men and women seek treatment. That's androgenic alopecia or pattern hair loss. And that kind of hair loss is caused mainly by interactions between male hormones and genetics. It looks like this in men, it looks like this in women, and it looks like nothing in mice because unless those mice are genetically modified, they don't really develop male pattern hair loss. This is one reason why when it comes to hair loss research, mouse models translate so terribly to human outcomes. In fact, when mouse models match with human models for hair growth, this is the exception not the rule. We've seen this so many times over the course of the last decade. I mean, mouse model studies showed that carbon-60 regrows hair. Human data showed it does nothing. Mouse model studies show copper peptides regrow hair. Human data show it does very little at all. Mouse model studies showed PGD2 inhibitors regrow hair. Human data showed PGD2 inhibitors perform about as well as a sugar pill. Since common causes of hair loss in mice do not correspond often with common causes in men, there's almost always a mismatch here. Also, just a short side note, in other fields of research like neurology, mouse models, they often do translate to humans. In these fields, it's just a matter of dosing or time to outcome that's less clear. I mention this because I've noticed this growing trend where scientists who are experts in one field of medicine, they'll talk about fields of medicine outside their specific expertise on a podcast or inside of an article. And when this happens and they start to talk about hair loss, oftentimes they misapply mouse model rules from their field of study to hair loss. I don't think this is happening nefariously, but I've seen this mistake maybe half a dozen times on major podcasts, and I see it about 80 times a day on X. So to all the scientists and professors who go on these podcasts and have an opportunity to disseminate health information, please just be aware of this. And if you want to learn more about how easy it is to actually manipulate a hair loss study in the first place, watch our video on how the hair loss industry is broken. It is a masterclass on evidence quality. It's perhaps the most important video we have ever made. And if all of our work disappeared tomorrow, it would be the one video that I had wished people had seen. So going back to peppermint oil, it's no surprise that its effects on mice didn't translate to men. But is that the whole story? Is it really completely useless for hair growth? Well, let's dig deeper to find out. First, let's revisit that key component of peppermint oil, menthol. As we mentioned earlier, balding scalps, they tend to have 40% lower oxygen levels and 2.6 times less blood supply than non-balding counterparts. So there is this link between hair loss and reductions to blood and oxygen. Moreover, several blood pressure lowering medications, minoxidil, dioxide, pinacidil, these things have been shown to regrow hair, not just in mice, but also in humans. Menthol is widely cited online as a vasodilator or something that allows more blood and oxygen to pass through pre-existing blood vessels. So could this be another way in which peppermint oil might regrow hair? As always, the answer is a little bit complicated. First, the loss in blood flow in balding scalps, it's very specific. It happens in the microcapillary networks directly underneath the hair follicles. And minoxidil is not just a vasodilator. It also helps to grow new blood vessels, specifically in these microcapillary networks. This is known as angiogenesis. And in all likelihood, it's this kind of improvement to blood flow that we need in order to regrow hair on our scalps. It's not just vasodilation. That's just more blood flow getting shunted through already existing blood vessel networks. And for this reason, that's why not all blood pressure lowering medications are going to regrow hair. Not all of the medications improve blood flow specifically in those microcapillary networks, but also improve blood flow by growing new blood vessel networks. So how does menthol stack up? Again, it is complicated. Of the 16 available in vivo studies on menthol, six link menthol to a blood flow decrease, eight link it to a blood flow increase, one found no change, and one found that menthol's blood flow related effects, they actually depend on its dose and where it's applied. In general, we see peppermint oil reducing blood supply in large caliber arteries and increasing blood supply in microcirculatory networks. So that sounds like maybe positive news in favor of peppermint oil's effects for hair growth in the scalp, but Again, we need to see if this improvement in microcirculation is also coming from the growth of new blood vessels in that scalp. Because 
Again, that's probably where it matters most. New microvasculature that's directly supplying miniaturizing hair follicles. So what other evidence is there that peppermint oil might help men and women regrow hair? Well, peppermint oil is part of the mint family. And so many of its subcomponents and volatile acids, they actually share overlap with another popular essential oil, rosemary oil. And interestingly, there was a 2015 study on men with androgenic alopecia that compared daily rosemary oil to daily topical minoxidil. After six months of application, the researchers actually found that rosemary oil was about as effective as topical minoxidil. Again, that is an FDA approved drug. And again, this study, it garnered a lot of attention on hair loss forums. I'm not gonna go through the same song and dance that I did earlier, but what about this study do we really need to know? First, it's that the study compared an unknown dilution of rosemary oil to 2% minoxidil not 5%. Most men, they use 5% minoxidil to treat androgenic alopecia because dosing studies show that 2% is not nearly as effective. Secondly, the hair count improvements in that study, they were not very impressive. Neither were the before and after photos. So at best, you're looking at hair loss stabilization over a six month window. That result might even be explainable through natural pauses to hair loss, which can happen, or even the seasonality of our hair cycle. For more information on that, again, check out our video about evidence quality. So even if peppermint oils, volatile acids, and some components has some overlap with rosemary oil, and even if rosemary oil helps to move the needle a little bit with pattern hair loss, it really seems like one of those lower leverage interventions overall. It doesn't really seem to me like it does much. And for us, with the people that we work with, we typically also see this reflected in real world reporting. So what does this all tell us? What can we glean from both the totality of evidence and the hierarchy of evidence on peppermint oil for hair growth? In my opinion, it is the following. Peppermint oil regrows hair in mice, even better than minoxidil, but the results of mouse models are not to be trusted. Peppermint oil might improve blood and oxygen supply in the microcapillary networks of our skin but we don't know if peppermint oil creates new blood vessel networks in that skin. So we really don't know if that mechanism has an impact on human hair growth outcomes. A family member of peppermint oil, rosemary oil, seems to regrow hair comparably well to topical minoxidil and in humans. But that study showing those findings, it was done on 2% minoxidil, not 5%. And the results were very mild overall, with no noticeable cosmetic hair regrowth in any of the participants before and afters. So should you use peppermint oil for hair regrowth? In my eyes, I see this as sort of a lower leverage topical ingredient for hair regrowth. If you are going to try it, consider dilutions of 1% to 3%, apply it every day. And if your preferences are to stick to an all natural regimen, also try combining it with better supported topical ingredients. Saw palmetto, caffeine, melatonin, L-carnitine, L-tartrate, adenosine triphosphate, there are a host of others. Combine its use with other interventions, perhaps oral supplements or microneedling or scalp massages, you name it. And maybe this multi-targeting approach will increase your odds of success and perhaps lift you into that realm of slight improvements. If you wanna learn more about a straightforward approach to treating hair loss, watch our video on how to fix hair loss in men. And if you do give this a try, let us know how it goes and give yourself an exit timeline. We don't want you getting into the trap of trying something, seeing ambiguous results for a really long period of time, maybe years, but then always thinking, maybe I need time to see new regrowth. We have a video on how to establish evidence-based timelines for evaluations of any hair loss treatment. I will link that below. So if you give this a go for six to eight months and you're not totally thrilled with how things are going, I think it's time in that case to escalate your protocol. There are plenty of interventions out there that not only have better clinical support, but also have a bigger potential for hair gains. Again, that is all covered in our hair loss guide for men. So that'll do it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.